Next question is from Jory. If the parent is divorced, you fill out the info for parent number two. There is an option if, again, if your parents are divorced and there's no relationship, then you also don't have to fill out the answer for parent number two education level or for any of these follow-on questions. So you could just say other or unknown, basically, in response to that, if parents are divorced and there's no relationship there. Okay, next question. How is from twins? How does that work for trans male students? Are trans male students required to register? It's a great question. So this is in relation, I believe, to the selective service question. Let's find that in here. Where are you? Yep. Okay. It depends on which type of trans, like your, where on, on I guess, on the trans identity spectrum you are, right? So if you're an M to, M to F student, you usually do have to still register because it goes based on biological sex. If you're an F to, uh, FTM, female to male trans student, then you don't because your like your sex assigned at birth was female, basically. It goes based on your sex assigned at birth. All right, next question is from Raja. For parent school information, what should be filed for a parent who got a degree from India? I would say that you graduated from college or potentially professional or graduate school, right? If you got an undergrad, a bachelor's and a master's. Next question is from Jane. My, fa my student's father has a BA from an international college. At least one of the col colleges that we're applying to states a bachelor from the US. So that's probably on their application or frankly, their supplemental application within the Common App. So there you can answer honestly that the student's father does not have a bachelor's degree from U.S. institution, while the student's mother may or may not. Meanwhile, on the FAFSA, it's just asking about whether the parent has attended college. It doesn't specify U.S. or non-U.S., so I would usually recommend answering college or beyond when it comes to, when it comes to this question on the FAFSA. All right. Okay. Next question is from Jackie. What if I have more than 10 schools to apply? I also have a question from Killian. I, I hope I'm pronouncing that right as well. So let's recap how you enter in, how you enter in more than 10 schools. So you go in here and you go in and you enter your colleges. So let's say you've added all 10 colleges. Okay, great. Now you're going to skip ahead a little bit from where we are because we still have a couple more sections to walk through, but you're going to click on sign and submit. You're going to sign and submit the FAFSA to those 10 schools. Once you confirm that the FAFSA has been processed and sent to those 10 schools, and I would usually wait a day or two just so that they can confirm it on their end as well. Then you come back into this exact section, the school selection into your FAFSA form. And then you basically click remove on your existing schools and add in the new schools. So if you're applying to 15, you have your first 10, you submit it to them, and then you come back and then you add in those other five while removing five. And I think this also answers SM Bay Guy's point, which is, would you add the 10, 11 to 20 colleges right after submitting the additional 10 colleges? I would actually usually wait a day or two just to confirm that the first 10 colleges got the material. So high school, if a student is high schooled, sorry, homeschooled, is there an option? Yes, but it's actually an option you're going to fill out or you're going to address on the student demographic slide. So if you come in here to question number 26, which is about high school completion status, you're going to click homeschooled instead of high school diploma, right? And you're going to hit continue. So that's going to change the information there. And then what that's going to happen, what that's going to create is it's going to, it's going to basically remove the high school section for you because you're obviously homeschooled. So you have to select homeschooled in the student demographic section, and then you're able to reflect the fact that you are homeschooled. Next question is from D. Lugo. I have twins, so would I have them each create an ID before going on with the FAFSA, or do I have to complete two separate forms? You need both of them to create an FSA ID, and then once they do that, you're good to go, and you're just going to be able to enter in their FSA ID to be able to get started with filling out their FAFSA. All right. Uh, next question is from JMU2. I am planning to file my FAFSA only because I'm the main slash sole person who supports my child. But for CSS, both, should both my husband and I separate it and I provide information with the child, with the college, ask him to file the FAFSA as well? Yeah. So this is a great question because I know there's definitely folks in the audience who are in a divorce situation. If you and the child's other parent are no longer together, the FAFSA and the CSS profile treat you very differently. So in the case of the FAFSA, you only have to enter your information as the primary parent who has custody of the student. And the way they determine that is first, if one parent, if the student lives with one parent for more of the year, even if it's six months and one day versus five months and 30 days, 
it's whoever the student lives with more in a year. If it's exactly split down the middle in terms of custody, then it's whoever provides more financial support. So one tip I do have is if you are divorced but on good terms and one parent has a sort of stronger financial situation than the other parent, I would usually recommend figuring out custody, especially across the last year of the of high school to be more in favor of the parent who is, or spending more time with the parent who's financially less well off. In terms of how the FAFSA treats divorced parents, you just have to enter the information for the parent that the student's living with, plus if you are remarried, then the step parent as well. And one of the important things of the FAFSA is even if you and your sort of remarriage partner have a prenuptial agreement saying, oh, my new sort of spouse won't be paying for my child from a previous marriages or from previous relationships, a college situation, the FAFSA doesn't care. The FAFSA is like the only institution in America that can ignore a prenuptial agreement. So you have to enter your information as well as your new spouse's information. The CSS profile, on the other hand, you do have to enter information about both parents. So not just the custodial parent, which is the one that they live more of the year with, but also the non-custodial parent, which is the other biological parent. And then similarly on the FAFSA, sorry, Similarly to the FAFSA, the CSS profile also doesn't care about your prenup agreements. And the CSS profile is going to ask for original sort of custodial parent, custodial parents, remarried spouse, if applicable, as well as non-custodial parent and non-custodial parents, remarried spouse. So this is why I say that even though the schools that use the CSS profile do tend to be more generous with their financial aid, in practice, because they take into account so many more financial resources that they expect you to draw on, it, usually a CSS school is going to actually give you less financial aid on average. If the income varies in 2021 earn more than normal being part-time due to the pandemic, how can we tell that to them? So usually with the FAFSA, at least, there's not a lot of room for like explanations. So what you're going to want to do is submit the FAFSA and then send a letter to the financial aid office explaining your situation. If on the other hand, you are using, uh, you're applying to a school that's using the CSS profile, there are sections where you can explain special circumstances. So that is why the CSS does have more flexibility in handling special circumstances. But even if you're just applying to a school that only uses the FAFSA, then I would just write a letter to the financial aid office. Pretty straightforward. All right. Uh, the next question is from Hangzhou. Are all major public and private schools available in the FAFSA? Yes. Pretty much every university is available in FAFSA. Some for-profit colleges are a lot of for-profit colleges may not necessarily always be available in the FAFSA and non-traditional school options like coding boot camps might not be available in the FAFSA, but if it's an accredited four-year college, it's going to be in the FAFSA. The next question is from SY, where does the student create a FAFSA ID? So there's a way to do it in the site. I showed it a little bit earlier. You can just scroll back in the recording and see it. Next question is from Will. Did you say that the parent gets an ID too? At what point? Yeah. You didn't see me do this here because I was really focused in tonight's stream on just walking through the FAFSA, but you're in order to create an account to access the FAFSA, you create an FSA ID. You basically go in and you create, when you create an account, I'm not going to leave because it's going to mess up my form here, but you, when you first create an account, you're creating a, an FSA ID. All right. The next question is from SRP. Do EAD cardholders identify as citizens or which one do they select? So EAD cardholders are usually non-eligible or ineligible non-citizens, right? It's only really green cards or folks with refugee status or folks with DACA or uh, DAPA status that can, are considered eligible non-citizens. Here's from Lulu. Can you please go over again which tax year information is needed for 2023-2024 school year? You're going to need to use your full year 2021 taxes. Those are the taxes that you, for the most part, would have submitted on April of this year. So the 2021 tax year is the information that's going to be used on the FAFSA. Next question is from Seb. What assets need to be disclosed, specifically investments in deceased parents' pension and social security? So investments usually do have to be disclosed unless they're retirement investments or your primary residence. Deceased pet parents' pension and social security usually gets reflected as either taxable income or an asset that you like hold the, key, the keys to if it's in a brokerage account or something like that. So that's usually reflected on your taxes. But honestly, I'm not too familiar with deceased 
uh, parent pension and social security and ex the exact treatment of what you, what your plan setup is. So I'd honestly probably talk to an accountant to figure that one out. Next question is from Off Trail. If a student's earned 5K and it's in a savings account, then how does it affect FAFSA? Well, so for student assets, it, it's 20% assessment rate, whereas from your assets, it's a 5% assessment rate. So what I do is I would actually move the income, the, the savings money over into one of your savings or checkings accounts until after you submit the FAFSA. Next question is from Tom. Do you have to provide bank statements and investment statements as support for asset balances that you report? Yes, you do have to provide those supporting documents. Usually it's through the IDOC system, which is something that the college will give you access to after you submit the FAFSA and CSS profile.